Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fantasy Files podcast. This last week we uploaded an interview we did with Holly Tinsley, who is promoting her new book, The Hallows. And when we recorded this episode, we spent the latter half of our time talking about general fantasy book topics like what is grimdark as a genre and other nerdy discussions. So we decided to upload the part that was specifically about the Hallows as its own thing and then upload this as a more laid back off topic episode. And just a heads up, I was really sick while we filmed this episode so my voice is pretty scratchy for this one and it it was just kind of like awful for me. So hopefully it doesn't come across too bad in the final recording. Also, if you're watching this before April 5th, you can get a free copy of Holly's new book, The Hallows, or you can choose from a selection of other really amazing fantasy books by watching this video right here or right here, wherever it pops up. Uh, But follow the instructions in that video. It'll show you uh, how to claim your book. Super easy, no strings attached. You just get the book. It's awesome. And it supports us a lot. So thank you to all the people that have subscribed over the last week or so. Uh, But anyways, we had a great time at chatting with Holly as usual. So I hope you all enjoy the rest of this discussion. By the way, who did your cover art? And I will put the cover art on screen right now for all the people watching later. um, And it'll be in the thumbnail and stuff. But I'm curious who uh, who did your art? Well, interestingly enough, my cover art for The Hallows was actually done by Don Larder, who did the cover art for The Anatomy of Fear. Oh, and cool. She, I see the resemblance. Yeah, she's she's amazing. Um, I found Dawn completely by chance when I was looking for artists for Anatomy. And we worked together on that project. She came in really late into the game, kind of when the book was already almost complete and knocked it out of the park. And I was in the process of doing the hellos and I said, well, you know, I've got this this other book. Do you want to to do yeah, the cover for it? And she said, oh, can you tell me what the book's about? Give me a bit of like a feel for it. And I said, yeah, I said, it's a it's a, a noir book. I said it's set in a 1920s aesthetic. And she actually specialised in um, 1920s art. And she's done some really amazing, beautiful um, paintings and, and illustrations that are all kind of the 1920s uh, f- fairy tale style work, okay. which just was really stunning. So I knew straight away that I wanted to work with her on this project. And yeah, she, she sent over some concept sketches and uh, she showed me some pictures of a mural that she'd actually done in this guy's house, which was this gorgeous 1920s uh, window, like almost oh. like stained glass style. And it was it was just stunning. So, yeah, I knew straight away that I wanted to work with her and she knocked it out of the park straight away. That's Please. that's awesome. That's so cool. I saw a uh, I, I was so glad when this cover art finally surfaced because there was another one that had been floating around. I can't remember if it got, if it was just the one that was sent with my arc or what, um, but it was just the flower on the front. Like it was all black and then it was the flower and it said the hallows. And I was kind of like, oh, is that the cover art? And I, I'm like, it's not bad, but <laughs> I'm like the, the, the Vanguard cover art is so striking. I was like, oh man, I, I is this like the final version? And then when I saw this, I was like, that's what I was expecting. <laughs> I love, I love this cover art so much. Um, so yeah, it, it looks phenomenal. So, so props to her. I was also going to ask you the, the guy from the, the guy who did your cover art for the Vanguard series uh is he is he off the table now are you gonna go with a new cover artist for the next vanguard book oh i don't know how much (laughs) i'm gonna say about this now oh i'm sorry okay i can i can edit that out no no it's 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 cool just it's something that's been lurking in the back of my mind for probably about a year now because um, I have absolutely loved working with Luke who did the the covers for me for the first two books um he is fantastic artist uh, unfortunately, his life has just gone down a different direction now. So he's still doing art, which I'm very glad about, but he just doesn't have the availability now to, mm. to be able to continue the series, which obviously puts me in a bit of a bind because I have two books out and I need, <laughs> you know, covers for the, the next one. So I have, I have an artist in mind. 
Um, I don't want to reveal too much about them at the moment because we're still in the process sure. of talking about it. However, what might be happening after I finish the next book is we might be doing a Dulux uh, edition. So we will have oh. the full set and we'll do, we'll do a separate cover for the third book anyway, which will like kind of, you know, match the tone and style of the first two. However, it looks like what might happen is we'll do a full re-release of the entire series as a collection um, with a Dulux cover, um, some really cool artwork, hopefully get some additional like posters and things going on. Um, I really haven't ironed out the details yet, but the artist I'm looking to work with is absolutely phenomenal um, and a really, really good character artist. So I'm excited to see how that pans out. But like I say, it won't be until after the next book comes out. So, okay. so watch this space situation. That's cool. Yeah, I I definitely need to get that because I I need to get a signed book from you because I finally got, oh, for my birthday this year, somebody bought me an actual like physical hey. copy of <laughs> We Men of Ash and Shadow, um, but I don't have it signed. And so I'm like, I'll, I'll I'll wait for the deluxe ones and get a get a signed one if that's what you're doing. <laughs> well, I I, I don't want to like m make anyone like prematurely excited or anything, but there might might be a hardback. Might. Fair that's enough. what I've been waiting for. <laughs> that's what I've been waiting for. That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so we're going to go into some general chatter. Uh, it'll probably stay around books, but it might stray into like other stuff. I don't know. Uh, we're just going to chat for a bit and hang out. But I do have a couple questions uh, relating, or not necessarily questions, but just topics uh, relating to Grimdark. I, so I might, I, I talked about the Parker books earlier, and I might take that out of that interview and kind of just talk about them here because I really I really want to tell you guys more about this because I think both of you would love these books like all of them are completely free on audible and each one there's like 24 books but they're all like they're like four to five hours long they're like very oh. very short stories and they follow this guy Parker like I said who is um, he doesn't work for the mob, but he does jobs kind of with like in tandem with the mob. And the way I understand it, it's set back in like they they might have even been released a long time ago. I'm not sure when they were when they were published. Let me just look at my audible real quick. If it's uh, is it written by Donald E. Westlake? No, Richard Stark. Okay, so they were they were released in like the 2010s. Um, so they're they weren't written that long ago, but they're set in like I don't know. I kind of picture them being in like the 40s or 50s, like or like maybe even like 30s through 50s or something. They're they're definitely set in the past, um, and I like these books so much because there is so many grim dark elements while it's still like a fairly not like modern day story no, but it's, it's not it says it says here sorry to interrupt you uh but it looks like like richard stark the mourner a parker novel first released in 1971 oh really yeah so interesting okay so maybe maybe the audiobooks yeah because it says release on audible it says the release date is 2011 and so i don't know if that's just uh a revision or must it it must be it would uh, that's kind of kind of what it looks like because the guy that originally wrote it was donald e westlake and it's got the same exact cover the same exact name the parker series but it says originally released in 1971 originally published okay do you see anything about richard stark i think richard stark might be a pseudonym maybe because oh. it says it says richard stark on the top of the book but then oh, okay. it says author Donald E. Westlake. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's probably a pseudonym then. Yeah. All right. Yeah, sorry, that, I didn't. That that's right. interesting. I I kind of got the vibe that they were written a while back. Um, but listening to it on Audible, it one hundred percent does not feel like an old book. Yeah. Like it feels like something that was written today. And I think that's why I've been enjoying them so much. And honestly, that's that's probably why they're free on Audible too. It's just because they're like very old books but they are 
so much fun. They, there is so much, so many grim dark elements to them. It's they're very noir, and I think for a while I've been looking for a book that just <laughs> kind of made me feel like icky. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just, <laughs> that just gave me that feeling where I'm like, ooh, like nobody's a good person. They're all bad. And somehow I'm rooting for all of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I, I think I've, I've read a lot of Grimdark recently where the world is Grimdark, but the main character is like very much a good guy. And that's not always bad. I, I like those stories as well. Um, but every now and then I just want like a dirty Grimdark book. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just like. <laughs> something where i'm like everybody is awful and this series does that so well the the main character i i kind of mentioned this earlier but like everybody that he did genuinely care about has been killed and that basically happens at the big like that happens before the beginning of the first book um and so he doesn't really have anyone left to like be a good person for and he just kind of is trying to make money and like rob banks and pull like different heists and stuff and he's trying to like screw over the mob and run away from the mob and all these different things and through all of that he is using all these people along the way and you hear this and you're like okay well that's like a cool idea for a character, but how do they make me root for him? Um, and I don't really know the answer to that. I just know that the whole way through, I'm like, oh, how's he going to get out of this bind? I hope he makes it out okay. And like the whole time, I'm just like rooting for him. And he's such a, he's like funny in a very like, I don't even know what other character to compare him to. But just in a very like thug way, like in a very like brutal, dark humor kind of way. Um, and he's very he's very likable. I wish I wish I had anything else to compare it to, because everyone listening to this is probably like, you're crazy. Like, I don't know how I'll ever root for this character, but I promise you do. Uh, the, the book finds ways to, to make you root for him. And I think the cool thing about it, and this is what I love about well-written grimdark characters is that they're doing so many awful things that when you get just like a little hint of them being a good person, it makes you like kind of ride that high a little extra because everything else is, is so bleak. Um, there's this moment in, I think I, I'm like four books in now. So I think it's the second book where he's in the middle of running, uh, in, in the middle of planning a heist. And he's got this one guy that kind of comes from the outside, from like an outside organization that interrupts it. And he's like, well, you can't leave our hideout because if you leave, it's going to cause like, we have another week of this heist that we're planning and we we can't let you go back. So we have to like basically hold you captive here. <laughs> and so he does that. And the whole time you're just like, oh my gosh, this is awful. Like the, like the way he's treating this guy and all this stuff. And then it kind of comes to a point at the end where the guy that he's held captive escapes. But the main guy, Parker, he knows that if this guy is going to get killed if he goes to where he wants to go. And so he ends up kind of like running after him to try to, to try to save him. And it's just like this little glimmer of like, Oh, okay. So he went out of his way to like, make sure that this guy didn't die. I know that's really convoluted. I'm trying not to spoil too much, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's a series that I've never heard of. I wouldn't expect a lot of people to have heard about, um, but I highly, highly recommend it because I think it's just a really, really well done, like extremely morally gray character. <laughs> cool that it's free. Yeah. Yeah. They're all free and they're all super short. Um, you can literally finish like two in a day. I've I've yeah. been flying through them the past couple of days. So definitely, definitely recommend. I don't know. What what do you think, uh, Holly? Are there any grim dark characters that are completely morally reprehensible that you still root for 
I mean, I'm sure there are. Um, <laughs> the funny thing is, like, you talk about how difficult it, it must be to write a character that is, you know, uh, morally reprehensible or immoral or just, you know, a really bad guy and still have people root for them. But if you think about it, I mean, even more so outside the grimdark genre than in it, it happens all the time. Sure. I mean, you look at the, the you know, the romanticizing of, you know, pirates and mm -hmm. knights yep. and you know gladiators and highwaymen you know and and all these people who have these stories written about them where everyone goes like oh look you know what a you know jolly rascal off right. you know, yeah. <laughs> and marauding. when actually in reality these were just like major assholes like going right. around the world killing people <laughs> and stealing their stuff you know it's, yeah. i think grimdark just takes the filters off that and you know yeah. <laughs> takes that romanticism away so i think you know, you can look at grimdark characters, even the ones that are really morally reprehensible. And I think you can enjoy reading the character, not from the point of view of wanting them to to triumph or, you know, agreeing with what they're doing. But like right. you, you said there, you want to know how they're going to do it. You want to understand the whys and the wherefores and the, you know, what, what, what are they thinking next? So right. I think, you know, it's, I don't think it's always a case of like rooting for them. I think it's a case of wanting to see how it pans out. More that's than true. Anything. That that's true because I would say for me, so far in the Parker books, like the main, the main kind of antagonist is the mob, which have very good reasons for not liking Parker, and they have very good reasons for like going after him. But at the same time, the book frames them as the enemy and so even though parker is like not a good dude you have this other enemy to look at and be like okay but parker isn't these guys so therefore root for parker um and i think i've kind of recognized that throughout this series i'm like i wonder how many other characters i've done that with where i'm like okay this character is a complete asshole but they're not like the asshole right um, even looking at someone like uh, like Kyler Stern from the Night Angel trilogy in that first book, he is like an awful human being for the most part. Like he would <laughs> he would sell his own grandma if it got him closer to his uh, to his kill target. Um, but then it, it it frames it in a way where, yeah, Kyler is this bad guy. But then you also have um, Roth some uh i forget his name whatever the main like bad guy of that first book is uh something roth 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 or or sewell i think um and it frames him in such a way where it's like yeah he's the bad guy he's the guy we're fighting so root for kyler right um yeah, right. i i think that's uh that's so interesting how it's it's really about perspective and comparison like oh well he's not as bad as this guy it's all about perspective well so speaking about uh grimdark and perspective and stuff there was a post that went up on twitter recently and i don't want to put this person on blast um because i think the i think the post kind of blew up a little bit um but i think it does provide a really interesting topical discussion uh they say when people say that grimdark is more realistic or comes from a place of realism they're telling us something about themselves not about literature and i'm like mm. i'm like it, it, the way the way i look at grimdark the the fact that i enjoy it and and think of it as being more realistic is that saying something about me and and how i view reality i i think to some extent um but i also think that grimdark is i don't know i'll 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 let you guys go do you have any do you have any thoughts on that about um grimdark being kind of labeled as more realistic than other fantasy like epic fantasy and stuff i don't know i would think that uh you know i read some grimdark i don't think i i mean i enjoy it just not not as quite as much as spencer but i would think that you know that high fantasy and all that stuff is all you know dragons and rainbows and crazy <laughs> elves and stuff right but then because the thing about life like real life it's hard difficult 
at times and stuff can be really bad or it can be really good. And even though grimdark, you know, it's obviously we're not, you know, we don't live in the twenties anymore or whatever else, but I feel like it just poses challenges that may not be exactly what's happening in real life, but it's still dark yeah, and still kind of, you know, just, I guess down, if that makes mm -hmm. any sense. Yeah. I don't know. Just cause reading some books, you know, everything is good, even when the bad stuff happens, but in some grim dark books, you know, you really feel like, wow, this is terrible. Yeah. You no, know? I don't know. Yeah. You, you feel the kind of like overwhelming oppressive nature of yeah. the world. And you can, yeah. And you can relate to that in different ways, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that's why, I think that's why we men of ash and shadow clicked with me so much was that I, I think I had been waiting for a book where just like everything that <laughs> is going to sound so weird, but just like everything felt kind of hopeless. Like everything was just like, like borderline apocalyptic where ev just everybody sucks. Everything is very gray and people are just trying to survive. Um, and I think that before We Men of Ash and Shadow, probably the Night Angel trilogy was the closest I had gotten to that, although that has a lot of like epic fantasy moments as well. Mm. Um, and so whenever I whenever I think about like what the ideal Grimdark is, like what the standard for Grimdark is in my head, uh, I tend to think of We Men of Ash and Shadow because it, it really just checks all those boxes um, with the city being so like, you know, like we were saying earlier, even the people that are in power are not doing well. Like they're yeah. not, they're not like, you know, sitting in the top of their like palaces and mansions and stuff, or like maybe they are, but that mansion is probably falling down around them. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on this, Ollie? Um, I mean, I have, I have lots of thoughts <laughs> on it. Um, I think, <laughs> One thing I will say is over the last probably two or three months, I've noticed there's been a big pickup in um, Grimdark bashing. And mm. it seems like the kind of it's all of a sudden it's become like the cool topic to, yeah. to you know, have a kind of a pop at the genre. And and first off, I don't really think it's like that deep of a, a yeah. subject. I mean, for one thing, no one can actually agree what grimdark is or if it's the genre. Yeah. So, you know, I think to look deeply into the what does it say about the psychology of people that read it? I mean, it, you could say the same thing about people that listen to true crime podcasts. Yeah. You know, right. and yeah. there could be a deeper meaning behind it. It could just be that people like <laughs> find it interesting and entertaining, yeah. or whatever. Right. And secondly, I think that. What when people talk like this about Grimdark, I think they are talking with the perspective of someone who thinks Grimdark is only one thing, and that is uh, to be completely nihilistic and right. have no hope. And I kind of talked about this in a podcast recently, is that hope is something that is very much individual um, and comes down to your interpretation of what that means. Mm. So prime example there, We Men of Ash and Shadow, People have said to me, oh, you know, it's it's like a really hopeless world. There's there's really no nothing for people to live for. You know, it's just survival and that's it. And I would argue that I actually find women of Ash and Shadow to be inherently hopeful mm. because I think that if you're in a situation where there is absolutely no chance of anything changing or getting better or progressing, or you know, there's even no chance of you surviving to still take action in your life and to have autonomy in your life and to want to do things you know Carmen lives in a world where she is never going to be better than she is now if she even survives and yet she still learns to read and write and she still becomes literate and to me you know that's that's hopeful that's in that's something that is in, right you know, I'm not saying my, my book is inspiring that sounds really sure. egotistical but that kind of scenario in life you know to me that's that's not grim dark that's that's hopeful yeah. you know yeah i i would i would totally agree and i think that's what i like about grim dark and that's what i like about we men of ash and shadow where for me the hope is 
in We Men of Ash and Shadow specifically, it's seeing Vanguard's character arc. It's seeing him go from this like person that has no moral compass or like did once upon a time and then lost it and is now kind of coming back little bit by little bit uh, with, you know, the help of Carmen and his other friends and stuff. And and then, yeah, and then you have Carmen who um, is is doing her thing throughout the story and is becoming better as a person and whatnot. And I think that I think Grimdark for me, what I like most about it is having those really desperate situations those situations that seem really hopeless and then just having like the one little spark but like the one little thing that is like moving us towards you know hopefully what we'll see like at at the end of what we would usually see at the end of a series where things kind of start to turn around for the better um and i think that you know grimdark it, it it has that in shorter supply and i think it works for the better because then it it's so much more pronounced like if you have a bunch of candles in a dark room it's going to be like a fairly well lit room but if you have just like the one little thing to draw your eye it's going to stand out so much more um and so i think that's kind of what i like about about grimdark and what i like about we men of ash and shadow is that um, the hope, the hopeful parts stand out so much more because of all the hopeless parts all around it, I think. And then as far as like, what is like, what does Grimdark mean? Um, yeah, this is one that I've seen discussed a lot lately where, you know, like you were saying, it's become kind of popular for people to, to bash grimdark a little bit where it's like well what even is grimdark like is there really such a thing as grimdark if we can't even define it and i don't know i i think that i have a very specific interpretation of what grimdark is and i think something like we men of ash and shadow would basically like tick all the boxes for for what i expect from grimdark um and I think I think Night Angel probably would as well, although Night Angel kind of veers into epic fantasy there in the second half. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely a hard thing to describe. I think that you have kind of the older crowd who's like, Grimdark is Warhammer 40k, like this big, bleak, like giant battles in space kind of kind of thing. Um, and then you have like the the younger crowd or people that haven't read Warhammer that are like, oh no, Grimdark is like fantasy, like roguish thieves, morally gray. And then you have people that expand it into an even broader circle to where it encompasses like Game of Thrones and what's the other popular one to label as Grimdark? I, I can't remember, but like the there's the people that like widen the circle a lot to the point where it's like any epic fantasy with morally gray characters is suddenly grimdark. Like I saw somebody on a YouTube comment the other day saying that the Lycanius trilogy is grimdark. And I'm like, what are you smoking? This is a series about time travel. Like what, <laughs> what, what are we doing here? Um, and so I think, I don't know. I kind of feel like there has to be some sort of happy medium between labeling everything as grimdark and then being so hyper specific that you get fixated on on small things i i don't know any thoughts i think it's really tough because i think as far as i'm concerned grimdark is almost intangible like you can't say it is a specific thing it is a flavor it's a it's a vibe it's a tone and you can't like you can't quantify that into saying, mm. oh, it must include this. It must. I've read books where you know everyone dies and everyone's miserable, and it's just atrocity after atrocity. And I still wouldn't the Dark Oak it. series. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I still wouldn't class it as a grim dark book because mm. it doesn't have the grim dark tone. Whereas there's other books that I think 
you know, are not anywhere near as dark or as bloody or as like full of death. And they 100% would be grim dark um, yeah. just because it's got that vibe and mm. you can't describe it. It's it's really difficult to, if anyone hasn't read it, yeah, you can't, it's like trying to describe a scent. You just can't do it. Just can't do it. That's it. <laughs> All given over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's so true. There's, there's certain books like, uh, like the the first law trilogy is one but yeah there there's a couple series that are like labeled as grim dark and by all accounts they have all of the 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 list of qualifications but when you read them it's like this just doesn't feel like grim dark like to me the first law trilogy does not feel like grim dark like i don't i don't know what it feels like people I mean, it's touted as one of the best grimdark series of all time. But whenever I've read it, I'm like, this feels like fantasy. Like, I don't know. It just doesn't it doesn't have that like grimdark vibe for me. But for other people, it does. So that that's cool. But um, I've never been able to see that series as like a, a true like grimdark series. And I don't know why. Do you, do you know what I think it is? And I'm I'm probably going to, I probably shouldn't say this, I'm probably going to get bashed for this. No, no. But I think it's to do with the tone of writing. And I think what happens is sometimes I read a book that's supposed to be grimdark and the the way the author's written it feels very enthusiastic and very positive. And I'm sure all authors right. are enthusiastic about their work. But I always think that when mm. I read grimdark, that really feels grimdark, it kind of feels like the author is just as sick of this shit as anyone mm. else is. <laughs> like, you know, you can kind of imagine the author's just like lying there, like typing with a hand, you know, yeah. going, when will this be over? <laughs> like... That's so true. That that's that's such a good point. There's so many um, you know, even yeah, I, I want to mention Dark Oak, but there are certain parts of that book where I'm like, no, nah, this is grim dark. Like, I don't, but there, there's other books like, like First Law or like, um, I, I wish for the life of me, I wish I could remember what the other one was. Um, but, uh, where it, it just sounds very, the, the narration, just like the general narration of the book sounds very kind of jaunty in nature, whether there's like a lot of a lot of humor, even if it's dark humor, um, it can come off very like playful. And I don't think that Grimdark needs to be super serious all the time. There's a lot of really good humor in the Vanguard series, but it's very dry like almost borderline monotone humor where you can just picture vanguard being like fuck like it just <laughs> like it's not like a haha funny kind of thing it's more like a situational like ironic kind of kind of humor um and i think that i think that some authors just aren't able to to capture that very well but one author that i think did it really well is um gabe can you look up who wrote uh the vagrant yes oh is it anthony ryan no not not anthony ryan he wrote the the pariah that is it yeah that's what i'm thinking of and uh the pariah peter felt... newman peter newman thank you um the pariah felt really grimdark for a while until it got to like the second half of that book. And then I was just like, I hate this book. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, the vagrant was one of my favorite books of last year. I think it, it didn't make it onto my, on my top 10, but I, I loved, uh, I loved reading that book because it's kind of following this guy who is, um, mute like he can't talk at all the whole like narration everything you're experiencing this world through is his actions and the world around him and you don't have anything to distract you from that you don't have anything else to like judge this character on other than how he interacts with the world around him and so you're hyper focused on those two things those are the only two things you have to focus on and as he's going through this world, you just see this bleak, apocalyptic, borderline fallout style, just or a 
I, I likened it to The Road by Cormac McCarthy, where everything is just desolate with the occasional little settlement that he would come across and just awful, awful people all the way through. And uh, I, I think that was done really well. I would 100% consider that a grim dark book um, because, and what's funny is the, the main character, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call him a bad guy, but you don't know that from the beginning. You just have to like judge him on his actions throughout the entire story. And so it, it's kind of cool how, you know, we, we talk about hope in grimdark and throughout the whole book, just bad thing after bad thing if, after bad thing is happening to this mute guy as he's just trying to make it across the land with like this little baby that he picked up somewhere along the way and uh, and his goat his goat <laughs> that he's towing behind him have you read this one holly no i have i've heard oh. i've heard a few people mention it but i mean come on you know me i read like three books a year so i have to be very selective <laughs> oh man you you have got to i think i think I you would it. love it you I started it. it yeah yeah, never finished it, but oh, should you back. should, you should. I I loved it so much. Um, and now that I'm even like talking about it, I'm like, shit, this should have been on my top five for last year, but because I loved it so much. Um, but Holly, I I think I think you would love it. Uh, not only for like the characters and and the world and everything, but just the, just the way that the story is conveyed to you is very different than anything else. I've read because like I said, you don't have any dialogue to go off of. You have other people that are like talking around him, but your main character is unable to, to engage in that dialogue in any real meaningful way. Um, and so it was just a very cool, it must've been like a very cool writing exercise for, for Peter Newman. That sounds very cool. Very yeah. cool. Um, what are you guys reading lately? I'm, I'm, I'm making my way through the Parker books and I don't think we, yeah, we don't have like a book to read for next weekend. So we're kind of just reading whatever we want. Have you, have you been reading anything lately, Holly? Now that you're wrapped up with your book? Funnily enough, I actually have been reading. Uh, I've been reading for most of today, actually, which is very impressive for me. I have <laughs> I've already finished one whole book this year, which is a personal best. Um, <laughs> but at the moment, uh, at the moment, I'm reading Les Mis. So I, I can't remember if I actually talked to you guys about this the last time I was on. I don't think I'd bought it at that point. But <laughs> last year, I got a copy of Les Mis when I went away for a weekend. We went to this really cool old bookshop that we found, like little indie bookstore. So I bought it and I started reading it in September last year and I'm still reading it now and I'm on page like I think it's like 290 at this point um but it's it's awesome I love this book so much I I think it's probably if it carries on the way it's going going to be my favorite book of all time um it's yeah I mean I I don't know how familiar you guys are with Les Mis, the story. Um, I think people obviously know it's a musical in a film right. and all that. Yeah, it's the story itself, the writing is just on another level to like anything that I've read in the last maybe 10 years or so. It's yeah, it's 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 hard to kind of describe, but <laughs> it's you, the the author writes in a way where you could tell it's just an absolute indulgence for them. They are just, mm. I mean, it was like what, 1871, I think when it was first published. So it's really flowery. It's really over the top. I mean, he, he literally used like where one sentence would suffice. There's about 15 chapters to describe the color <laughs> of some guy's buttons and like why <laughs> that was important. Oh my gosh. Um, and then it goes off on these mad <laughs> tangents where he'll be talking about stuff that was, you know, for the author genuinely happening at the time. So, you know, what was playing at the theatre, what was oh. in the newspaper. There's oh. like several chapters where he's talking about um, the Battle of Waterloo, you know, for, for for no apparent reason other than that he just really wanted to write like <laughs> 20,000 words about the Battle of Waterloo. But it's just, I can't stop reading it. It's hmm. so, so good. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. What do you think about... 
like besides something like Les Mis, which is obviously a, a classic um, for most fantasy or, or other fiction. What do you think about the balance between like world building or just like extra stuff to main plot and characters or side plot and characters? Because there was a book that I saw recently where they said like, oh, the character like doesn't really do anything or like they, they are doing things, but it's not necessarily related to like the main plot and things just kind of get described at length. And I'm like, well, you're, you're kind of describing the King Killer Chronicles, which like I, I would say is like one of one of the best modern fantasy books of all time, uh, Name of the Wind. And then you have books like th there's other books that do it in a way where I'm like, can we just get back on topic? Like, can we just get to the point? Um, and uh, an example that I have, and, and this isn't one of the worst ones by a large margin. It's actually it's actually not very bad at this at all. But there was times with uh, We Break Immortals where sometimes Thomas would be describing a town square or like there was this one town they went to where there was like four towers and it was described why all four towers were there and how that fit into the history. Um, but like all, all that information was good and I enjoyed it, but it didn't have anything to do with like what the characters were there to do. They didn't really interact with the towers in any real way. Um, and so it felt very extra and like it could have been cut out. Do you, do you notice this a lot, Holly, with, with books you read or, or do you notice this Gabe at all? I would say I noticed it, um, but I, I think I like it. Okay. You know, I don't mm -hmm. I don't think it bothers me just because it even though it may not have to do with the overarching story or whatever, it's just kind of another, you know, another little look into a city. I'm I'm trying to think of specific books where that's happened, but I won't be able to on the spot. But I do remember seeing stuff like that. And it was like just cool. You know, I, I would think if they went in this huge, you know, six Tangent. chapter thing yeah, yeah about it and then we never see it again that would probably bother me but yeah. i don't mind a little history lesson real quick you know sure it doesn't bother me sure yeah. i think uh i think the king killer chronicles does this uh pretty often but i think that that he does it in such a way that makes you interested in yeah everything that he's saying yeah um but then there's some books where i'm just like make it stop like just just get back <laughs> on topic please yeah <laughs> i think it's it's the distinction between a tangent and filler so yeah. if, i mean lay is just perfect example for this um my sweet spot for books is about 300 pages any more than that and i am usually going to tap out pretty early um i like short books and i like short like prose um so for me to pick up a book that's like just shy of 1300 pages is just I mean I have no business picking this book <laughs> up whatsoever but I think because every kind of 300 pages or so oh no that probably every 100 pages we just go off on this wild tangent and you know there'll be a bit in a book where a farmer goes past on a cart and then I get like 10 pages of you know what was the peach yield for farmers in southern France in 1865 <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that because like yeah. my, my little distracted brain can like just have a little wonder and then come back so yeah. if it's a tangent it works if it's filler I think that's where it becomes like it starts to feel bloated and yeah you kind of just want to get back to the main story yeah and, and I think I think it's doubly as hard when even I don't know, maybe this maybe this is just more about like a book that I'm not necessarily clicking with in the first place, but I tend to notice it more when the main story is already I'm already struggling to be captivated by it. Um, yeah. And then it goes on to do something like describe something else, because I think with something like the uh, the Sun Eater series by Christopher Rocchio, people love that series so much. And they describe it as, you know, like King Killer meets Red Rising. 
And that sounds like such an ideal book for me because I love both of those things. But in that series, I, I was wanting so badly for the main character just to get where he was going so that we could see the story really start to take off. But then every step along the way, he would stop in some like side town or describe something for like a long period of time. And I was like, I'm already wanting you to hurry along and and get to the point. And then you also add this stuff in. And I think that's where it starts to get kind of kind of difficult for me. I don't know. That's fair. I mean, that's I would probably be the same way. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're already struggling with it and then they hit you with some filler. Come on now. What have you been what have you been reading lately, Gabe? Nothing new. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, I always glance at your 99% of the time I'm logged into your Audible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I always just glance at, you know, I'll see a couple new books pop up and I'll glance and read and see, yeah, I might like that, might not. But I uh, I read Project Hail Mary again. Oh, yeah. Um, Finished that yesterday. Such a good book. <laughs> um, And yeah, and I'm thinking about giving The Will of the Many another try again too yes dude that yeah. was oh man let's talk about that for a second okay. have you have you seen this book around holly what's it called again the will of the many by james eilington he did the lycanius trilogy i don't think i've heard of that one I, it's, do you know i always feel so bad when you ask me these questions because no matter what book you ask me i'm like no. <laughs> don't feel bad don't feel bad because no, i do the okay. same exact thing there, there's a lot of books out there uh yeah it is I I think that so far it is my book of the year. I wow. I I started it and I I was probably like and, and I hate it when people tell me this because I'm like my my belief is that a book should be able to grab you within the first couple chapters and you know maybe like a third of the way in or something it can drop a little bit but because you're hooked from those first couple chapters it'll keep you going. Um I'm usually not someone that sticks around for a book if I'm 25% of the way in and it hasn't grabbed me yet. Um, but in this situation, we had somebody that wanted to read it with us for an episode. And so I was like, well, I have to read the whole thing. And I'm so glad that that was the circumstances in which I read this book because otherwise I probably would have DNF'd it. The beginning is tough. It it throws you into this world where there is this hierarchy, there's this class structure where there is like definitive people at the top who are without a doubt more powerful. And then you have everybody else below them going down in a pyramid kind of way. And what happens is everybody in this world has magic. They all have some sort of inherent magic and they're all feeding it up the pyramid to the person at the top. So the people at the very bottom are taking 50% of their magic and they're passing it up to the row above them. And then they are taking 50% of their magic, which is also 50% of the people below them and pushing that up. And so everybody on each row gets left with essentially like 50% of what they would usually have and the people at the top are getting exponential growth um, to where like the people at the top are basically gods. And it is so cool to see this system because I think it's very common to have a fantasy series where there's like a class system and like, oh, the people at the top are more powerful and they kind of look down on, you know, the poorer people or whatever. But this is like there is a tangible like it is incredibly difficult to take down. Like if you're trying to start a rebellion or something, it's hard to take down the people above you because they have what you have. They have your 50 percent of your magic plus whatever they have. And uh, it's, it's just so the the dynamics of it all are so interesting. And it follows this kid who had his mom and dad were the king and queen and he they die 
uh, basically his whole family dies. He's the lone survivor and kind of goes off to live in obscurity so that he doesn't get killed. Um, and then he gets adopted by someone kind of in the middle of the pyramid, uh, like the higher, I guess, like higher middle of the pyramid. Um, he gets adopted by somebody because they want him to go to this academy to try to take down this certain branch of the pyramid. So that's kind of the the general idea. But my point of all this is, is that it took a long time for all of that to get explained. It took a long time for that to all play out in the first like, like 30 or so percent of the book. But once I got past that, I was just hooked, like just flying through this book. Once Once he gets adopted and he starts training and learning and then kind of gets shuffled off to the academy it's just is so so amazing like i got to the end of that book and it broke my brain it was one of the first books in <laughs> yeah hey, cause here <laughs> it was one of the first books in forever that i had to look up uh like an ending explained video because mm. i'm like what is this twist holy crap and i had to like go to the internet to like figure out exactly yeah. what it all meant. Um, and then once it got explained, I was like, Oh, I see it. I totally get it. And so I wasn't left confused. It wasn't left vague really. Um, it's definitely a cliffhanger. Like there's definitely like another book that's coming that uh, it'll all be kind of leading towards. But um, the whole thing, the whole thing was incredible. Pe people have described it as like red rising, but fantasy and i'm like no i don't i don't think it's red rising at all like the the way the book is like narrated kind of feels like red rising but i think it was much more similar to like king killer than anything else i i got major king killer vibes from it i i think you'd like it you just have to like dedicate to getting to like 30 to 40 percent of the way yeah that that's fine because i definitely didn't get make it to where he was adopted yeah oh uh -huh. really no, oh, I dang, mean, I... yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I I think I think you would like it once once he gets adopted and actually starts doing stuff. I I think you'd be all in. Cool. There, there's not too many other things that I've been that I've been reading. I've also been kind of going back and rereading stuff. I've been doing a lot of like Dresden Files, like hopping back to like Proven Guilty or like White Knight or, um, I just read like Skin Game. Nice. And I'm like, man, I can't wait for us to start doing Dresden Files again. I know it's been I, been forever it feels like. Yeah, I reached out I reached out to our friends that usually do those episodes with us and um one of them said that she wasn't sure if she could do one in March and I was basically like, okay, well we need to record one in March. So yeah. just let me know what if a, you're not able to make it. What book are we on now? Ghost Story. Ghost Story. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yes. Have you ever thought about reading these books, Holly? I know, I know, there's a lot of books out there, but have you ever thought about Dresden Files? Um, I have. I've thought about it. I think I, I think I might have a few actually, because I think a few people recommended them to me when We Men came out, and I think they became one of those books where I, I got recommended about thirty or forty books. <laughs> yeah, everyone's like, oh, because you wrote this book, you'll probably like this. Yeah, and I, I have given some of them a go. Um, but I haven't got around to them. But it's funny you mentioned going back and rereading stuff that you've already read before. Because the the one book that I finished this year was one of the Sharp books by Bernard Cornwell, which I've read like every book at least once, some of them twice. So maybe this is the issue that I have is that I do actually read quite a lot of books. They're just the same book. Over yeah. and over again. <laughs> that's that's true. I I've seen more than a couple YouTubers at the beginning of this year saying 2024 is the year that I don't reread books. I'm only reading new stuff. And like, I, I totally get it content wise. I totally get why there's like YouTubers that are like, I'm, I, I have to like read new books so I can make content about it. But for me, I'm just like, I read new books and read new books. And then every now and then there's just like a random night, where I'm like, I need something that I've read before. Yep. I need something where I'm like familiar with it and I know exactly what to expect. 
Um, and so I, I think rereading is great. I, I encourage okay. people to reread all the time because there is no way that you can get everything from a story on the first yeah. go through, um, especially something like the Dresden files or like red rising or King killer. Like those are all things that you like need to read multiple times to, to understand everything. And so I, I think that's great. What, what are the sharp books? I haven't heard of these. Uh, so they are, it's a series that was, I mean, it's been out for absolute ages. There was like a really big TV show that they did adaptation of it back in probably the, like the nineties, which had uh, Sean Bean in it. Um, I remember because my mom had them all on VHS. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think there's, there's probably about between 15 to 20 in the series. And they follow um, this, the character Richard Sharp, he is a British soldier in the Napoleonic Wars, and he basically saves the life of Wellington while he's still Arthur Wellesley, and he gets given as like a reward, um, a commission as an officer. But he has come from like the slums of London, and he like was brought up like in a brothel, and mm. um, he is obviously rejected and ostracized by the officers who are all gentlemen in the British Army, and he rises through the ranks through a series of acts of like heroic deeds and he's basically he's a bit of a swashbuckler and he's a bit of a pirate and he doesn't play by the rules but he always gets results um okay. you know he just he just sleeps with every woman that he meets <laughs> you know he's, he's very much you know the kind of quintessential um rogue. Say, rom ro romantic rogue kind of okay. it's they're not, they're not romantic books right. but it's that romanticized kind of, rogue you know, he's he's a manly man going around doing manly man stuff, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, they're really good books. They're really good fun. And I Are think they long? Not hugely long. Um, the, I mean, I couldn't tell you page count, but maybe like 400 pages, something like that, I guess. Okay. Um, I mean, it took me a couple of days to read through one. But again, I've, I've read them already. So I've kind of probably skimmed a little bit. Um, right. I, I think what's cool with stuff like that is rereading them at a different phase in your life. So when I read these books originally, I was probably like early 20s, whereas now reading them in, you know, mid to late 30s, <laughs> um, you know, after having been writing for a few years, it's nice to go back and read them. I have a different appreciation for the prose and the characterizations. Um, and it's also it's cool as well, because I think when you see something adapted to tv or film that you've already read to then go back and reread it after you've seen the mm. adaptation that's another cool way of looking at it through different eyes because now yeah. obviously i read it again i read it in the voices of the the characters as they were on the show so everything's got like a thick yorkshire accent and yeah you know i that... can hear it sean bean in my head <laughs> That that's a great topic for discussion. First of all, it, are these are the sharp books? They're adapted. That they, they have. Yes, shows they are. Or I mean, they're, they're they're adapted, but there's there's definitely a lot of differences between mm. the books. Uh, so like in the books, for example, Richard Sharp is a Londoner who's dark haired and was brought up kind of in the the slums of like the East End or something like that whereas obviously in the tv show they that it's sean bean who is you know undisputably from yorkshire and sounds like he's from yorkshire and he's obviously very different so it's they've kind of slightly changed some of it within the character but the, the general storyline is more or less mostly the same okay very cool what what's the i'm looking at i typed in sharp bernard Corn cornwell What's what's the first one that I would start with? Uh, so it depends on if you are going to go by the if you go by the Napoleonic Wars, then it's Rifles is the first one. Okay. Um, however, there are ones before that which are there's a series of prequels which were set in India. Um, so I think that starts with I think Tiger. I'm not sure. I'd have to look because the prequels I haven't I haven't read all of those. So oh, I've okay. only read from, from Rifles onwards and then a few of the, the prequel ones. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to check these out. But speaking of adaptations, I put out a video somewhat recently talking about the Silo TV show and the Silo books. 
have you guys either seen these shows or or read these books at all? I don't think so. No, you said, I don't think I've been Silo. Yeah, I think I think you started. I think you might have started one. Oh, is that the books by Hugh? Uh... Yeah, Hugh Howie. Okay, yeah, I started it but never continued. Yeah, I think I. So I watched the show first because I I had gotten Apple Plus and I was just watching everything on on Apple TV, and the show just had me mesmerized. Like mm. I love this show so much. I think it's one of the best shows on Apple TV. Everybody should absolutely check it out. Um, and Wool, the first book in the Silo trilogy, was something that I had on my to read list for the past like three or four years um, and just never really got around to it. But after seeing the show, you know, in my head, I'm like, the book is always better, right? You gotta, I gotta go read the book. And so I did only to find out, like, I still liked the book. I don't think the books are bad, but I think the show is infinitely better. Like I, the book, mm -hmm. the show just does it in such a more interesting way and it's so it's so odd because usually a show will give you less content than the book does. Usually the yeah. book opens up the world in a bigger way. But when I went to read the book, I was like, where is this guy's storyline? Where is this guy's storyline? Like, where is this plot beat? Like, wh where are these things? And they just weren't showing up in the book, but they were there in the show. The show had everything that was in the book like literally everything plus more wow and i was like dude i don't know if i've ever seen an adaptation do this before yeah, like this good is for apple tv yeah like it's it's giving us more content than than what the book gave us and in my opinion better content like i, I think that some of the story beats that we get in the show are better than what we get in the book and it was such a weird experience, too, because, um, you know, I expected to go into the book and have it feel like much slower. Like, that's usually kind of how it goes. Like, it may be interesting, but it's usually slower than what a show does. And uh, and I got I got into this book and it's like clipping right along. Like, by the time I was only like four hours in, I was done with the entire first season. And then I found out that the first season of the show was only the first half of the book and so i'm like man they were really able to take this idea and play with it and stretch it out i'm like i think more of these adaptations should only be doing half a book rather than an entire book uh because you look at the wheel of time they had eight episodes to do that whole first book and it suffered for it um and then they did the same thing with with season two and I think they even brought parts of book three into season two. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit different when you have a trilogy versus a, you know, 14, 15 book series or whatever. But I don't know. I just thought it, I thought it was so interesting and it was so refreshing to get a show that was better than the book, in my opinion. I still think the book is worth reading. I still think people <laughs> should read the book. But the show was just outstanding i have to get your apple apple tv info because i don't have it anymore oh i thought you were logged into mine um no oh i, I yeah. think you gave it to me is it still the same yeah 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 you okay. can totally you can totally log into it there's so many there's so many good things on apple tv do you have this service holly I haven't. I feel like I need to get it though because there's quite a few things on there. But I do this thing where I tend to bounce around. So recently I had uh, the Paramounts mm -hmm. uh, channel for mm -hmm. a little while, caught up on all the stuff on that. At the moment, I've gone back to Netflix because there was a few shows on there I wanted to catch up with. Yep. So I'll probably, I mean, no one can afford to have all these subscriptions going yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, I kind of think if you wait for like maybe six months between each one, by the time you get back to it, there's like a little like oh yeah basket full of shows. Yep. You yep. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I do. I I had Hulu for a while, and then I had um. I think I I went to Netflix after that, and then and then Paramount, and then Apple TV. Uh, on Paramount, did you watch Yellow Jackets? Have you seen this? 
I did. Do you know what? I actually was, I thought about this. I think we had this conversation mm -hmm. Yeah. Before. And I think we were planning to watch it, but then we got into watching, um, I can't think, I'm going to have to look up what it's called. It's the West, the Western one. Which oh, was Yellowstone? The, Yellowstone? The one before that. So oh. is it 18, 1883? It's 18 something. Oh, okay. So we watched that, and then I think we moved to Netflix after that. But I mean, okay. that's an amazing show. Um, I'm going to have to Google what it's actually called now. Okay. Um, what? Have, what do you uh, guys have you oh sorry go ahead have you watched uh reacher spencer yes or holly holly has yeah. all right yeah yeah i i started the second season i'm gonna keep going with it i just need to find time for it um so far i like the first season a yeah. lot more the second season is nowhere near as good as the first absolutely yeah um but from what people have told me it seems like the no spoilers because i don't even know but the <laughs> the end of the second season it sounds like it's going back to what the first season was doing because i just didn't i didn't really like him meeting up with all his military buddies and just like having it be like this military show i was like i kind of oh. liked him being like this lone wanderer that like stumbled into this town and just kicked everyone's ass and left <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's fair that's yeah fair do you know what actually it, what I think what threw me off with the second season because I, I agree I think the first season was way better than the second season and I do think it's like you say it's more to do with the fact that they've made it an ensemble now rather than him right but also like I just find his size really distracting in the <laughs> because he has beefed up so much from the first season in the first season you thought okay this is a, a you know it's a big guy you know you yeah. can absolutely see that this is like you know you can buy into it, you know, that's realistically, you'd think someone doing that job would have that physique. And then like the second one, he comes in, he's like Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm not sure I'm buying this anymore. Right, yeah. 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 He's just this massive, massive dude. He's the a whole... shirt ripping off like every five seconds. Just I like, know, okay. yeah, <laughs> every chance they can get to get him shirtless. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I've thought several times like how does that guy get through doorways like he he, he needs like a double door entrance yeah. everywhere he goes like the cool man. man yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh yeah uh, oh yeah <laughs> um what, what are you watching on netflix uh so, oh um yes yeah, i so said we were on netflix however weirdly enough talking about re reading books I'm re-watching a lot of series at the moment. So mm. um, I have literally this week just finished re-watching um, Band of Brothers, which was oh, nice. HBO series. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Oh, yeah. Really just, oh, it's still even now, like this is probably the fourth or fifth time that I've watched it and I still cannot get through it without just breaking down in yeah. tears like, multiple times. It's so well done it's so moving and it's yeah. you know you get these kind of shows about real life situations that have happened you know wars and terrible disasters and things like that and you always feel like you know there's a little element of not glamorizing of it but sure. you know it's trying to make it look like everything was heroic and you know and it was all noble and I think Band of Brothers does a really good job of stripping that away and just making it about the people that yeah. were involved um, so yeah, rewatching that was was really cool. Um, made me do a lot of reading again on the subject. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I I tend to watch something and then read about it afterwards. Nice. Um, try to think what else we've watched recently. Say so Reacher, we've watched. Um, there was one that I watched and I can't think what it was. It'll come back to me anyway. I need to get I need to re up my Netflix subscription so that I can finally see the last season of Sex Education. I have not yes, seen I'm this. So disappointed that you haven't seen it yet. Oh man, I know. And I keep I, I feel like there's a part of me that's like the seasons one through three were so good. I'm so worried that they're gonna fuck it up with the fourth season. They don't. <laughs> and I'm like they don't I'm like I'll I just right I now, just want all my people to be happy. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely I'm definitely going I'm definitely going to watch it. I, I want to see it really bad, but I just keep 
I just keep putting it off. Yeah. But yeah, that's one that's one that I'm really excited for. But for for Apple TV, or first of all, have you seen Sex Education, Holly? Um, is that the one where it's like the teachers and the school, and it's like it's literally about like sex sex education? Um, kind of. So it follows this kid, Otis, whose mom is a sex therapist. Um, so like couples will come in to like talk about like marital stuff or like whatever. Um, and then Otis growing up with her, he knows so much about the subject and he knows so much about like puberty and like all these other aspects of this. His school is not doing like sex education really at all from what i remember or at least not very well yeah, not really yeah yeah and so he decides <laughs> he decides to open up his own like clinic there's like these abandoned bathrooms that are on campus and so his like office is this like abandoned bathroom and kids will come in asking for advice like oh, like my girlfriend doesn't like it when I do this or like my boyfriend's doing this thing and I don't know how I feel about it and like all this stuff. So people will come through and like ask him questions and it's all anonymous. He sits in like a bathroom stall and they sit in the stall next to him and he like gives them advice and then they pay him. Um, and then there's this girl, uh, Maeve, who becomes basically his best friend. Initially, she's only in it for like the business idea. Like we could make a lot of money off these kids with this like idea we have. And so she like organizes all of the like clients and stuff and like brings them in and then he gives them advice. And then him and Maeve like end up becoming best friends. And it's one of my favorite friendships, relationships, whatever you want to call it in all of TV. Like I, I love those two characters so much. And yeah, it's, it's really, it's really funny. It's really heartwarming. There's moments that, get me all teary eyed there's moments that make me belly laugh like it is i just love the show it's just an all around great show it's very raunchy like it's very very yeah, so raunchy so you I can't watch it like with kids and stuff yeah, but definitely. yeah <laughs> i think i think i did watch i think my husband watched it and i think he really liked it i think he really enjoyed it like similar to you he found it like really kind of uplifting and heartwarming mm. i think i watched like an episode an episode and a half and i really struggled with it mm. because i just i get so uncomfortable like with anything and it's not just like with stuff to do with sex it's like anything to do with like relationships and romance and yeah. it's oh. just like did like even now like, I can feel like my skin <laughs> I'm just like no not for me no yep. yeah yeah you know yeah. I, I get I totally get the appeal like I can see like why like in my husband really enjoyed it you know like I said for he said the exact same thing about the characters and like the kind of like openness of it and stuff like that but i'm just yeah. like no, that shit is private <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair enough yeah there there is definitely like a lot of a lot of things that would normally be private that happen like right out in the open and i think yeah i think what the show does so well is it offers an avenue for that where normally in any other tv show if a character were to say this thing, you'd be like, where the hell did that come from? Or like, why are we talking about butt plugs or whatever? Oh but <laughs> but in this in this situation, it's like, OK, we've we've set the standard for what's acceptable to talk about in the show right up front. So the bar is here and we can go anywhere now. Um, and so I think that's kind of why I like it, too, is because there are shocking things that happen in the show. But it's like it's like that's that's what it, that's like the point. Right. Like that's what that's where the bar has been set. Yeah. Um, and so I, I like that aspect of it, too, where it's just like anything, anything goes. And that's just how it is. <laughs> You're just along for the ride. Just along for the ride. Buckle up. <laughs> it's just it's, it's such a weird thing to me as well because I don't know where I mean maybe I just need to give it a, another chance but I don't know why it is that that show or the way that they frame like the subject matter well, doesn't work for me because I can watch a show that is you 
you know, raunchy and explicit, mm -hmm. you know, like your Game of Thrones and like, I mean, yeah. even that's probably not that raunchy, but you know, sure. to, to watch that kind of thing, like, I, I'm like, fine, yeah, like, whatever, it's it's all entertainment. But just, I think the way that that show is framed, where it's like the, the kind of like, I would never like in my life had a like a, a random conversation with somebody about a book plug. Mm -hmm. It just would not happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, that's true. This is just not right. <laughs> even I, even I, when I, when I started it with my fiance, there were some times where I got, you know, little, <laughs> same thing, a little uncomfortable. It was like, yeah. oh, wow. My face, you know, face turned a little red. Yeah. Like, should I, do I want to watch this right now? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you, you get through enough episodes and you just kind then of it just be learn yeah. what to yeah. expect. And yeah. it's like, okay, we're, we're in it. We get it. Um, Cause yeah, at first I, matter of fact, I think the first time, like when I watched the first couple episodes, I was like, oh, wow. And then over yeah. time, it just <laughs> yeah. kind of becomes normal. <laughs> just become numb like to just. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and also, I will say, if it's like um, if it's like a nudity thing, if you don't like nudity in shows, they kind of they put that in like the first maybe like two or three episodes. They kind of have that there. But then that dies out pretty quick and you don't like i'm sure you get nudity or whatever later but it's not nearly as frequent as like the first episode or two because i think sometimes what shows try to do they're like oh if we put a bunch of nudity in the first couple episodes we'll get a bunch of people because it's like raunchy or whatever is like okay but i i think that that kind of dies down as the as the episodes go on yeah sure. it's not the nudity is definitely not the problem it is the yeah. it is the topics. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's it's I think it's it's when it's so blasé as if like yeah you know this it's just not something that I <laughs> could ever I yeah yeah I get it. It's hard to explain, but you you get it. You get I get it. it. I yeah. totally get it. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, but on so going back to Apple TV, you got to watch make a make a mental list. You need... Okay, I'm not very good at mental list, but let me pull out my phone. <laughs> okay, yeah, both of you. Severance, you need to watch Severance. It is a complete mind fuck, and it will destroy your life. You need to watch <laughs> Ted Lasso. Not very... I've already said watch Ted Lasso. You seen it all? No, I haven't seen all of it. Oh, okay. But I've seen quite a bit of it. Yeah, okay, so you need to... Ted Lasso is one of literally the best TV shows I've ever watched, like up there with... The Office, Scrubs, like all that kind of stuff. It is by far one of the best shows I've ever seen. Um, Shrinking is another good one. It's kind of along the same like hopeful vein as Ted Lasso. Uh, it's about a guy who is a therapist and oh. he has some unconventional methods for his to, as a counselor that some would consider malpractice um <laughs> but it's very it's very like heartwarming um like he he just goes like too far out of his way to help people like he mm. he like opens his home up to them and stuff um and so that and then silo silo is the other one and I think those are like my my big four for Apple TV: Severance, Silo, Shrinking, and Ted Lasso. Those right. are have you, must have you guys, must watch. Have you, have you guys watched Blue Blue Eye Samurai yet? No. no, is this the anime? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so good. You have to watch it. That's got to oh, go on the list. Awesome. Where, where where where? Yeah, where can I watch it at? Is it on uh, that's, Netflix? That's an, a Netflix one. Okay. Cool. Oh, okay. But yeah, hundred percent. That's probably my. If not my favorite, probably top three of last year. What what is it? I I've heard the name, but I don't know what it is. Um, uh, so it's it is an anime. It's basically following a um. Uh, I mean, she's not not technically a warrior because she's not in like any kind of warrior club. But it's it's a a, a woman who is disguising herself as a man going through feudal Japan, um, oh, okay. trying to find her father, um. And obviously just kind of meeting lots of people and getting into lots of scrapes and fights along the way. So it's it's a difficult one to describe without spoiling it too much. So I yeah. don't want to give too much away. Okay. But it's I mean no, it looks awesome. animated. 
is it more about like the journey than the plot kind of thing um it's a little bit of both i would say um it's it's anime man <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay okay cool i'll have to i'll have to check that out i've heard lots of people talk about it but um i've had i've had no idea what it is um but speaking of anime, Gabe, as of this recording, three days ago, mm -hmm. the Sword Art Online movie that I saw in theater, yeah, it's now on Crunchyroll. Oh, sick, dude! Yeah, so we got that's awesome. I'm gonna go a watch party that, that right now on my thing. Have you have you ever heard of Sword Art Online? No, it's no. it's gonna sound the the way I describe it. It's gonna sound really kind of like I don't know like very anime or like maybe a little very anime. <laughs> but i i think it's 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 way more well done than you would initially think so basically it follows uh our main guy is kirito and he the the world there's this video game that has kind of taken the world by storm and it's done through these like virtual this virtual reality headset and when you put it on, it's not just like you in a room playing it like you're laying in bed and it actually like takes you there. Like it, it like kind of transports your your mind to this place. Um, and so everybody's playing it on launch day. And basically the the guy that created it comes down in his avatar and he's like, you're all stuck here. And if you die here, then you die in real life. And so it's this interesting thing of like there I feel like there's other animes that would be like, well, let's fight our way out of here and like everybody rush to like kill whatever we need to kill to get out of here and like finish the mission. And the guy does say like the game is set up like a tower. And so if you make it to the top of the tower, like you can beat it or whatever. Um, I feel like other animes would be like just everybody like, yeah, let's go and like lots of plot armor and stuff like that this is not that at all there's people there's a lot of people in this group that are like oh i'm just gonna stay in the beginning town because i don't want to like go out and die and it's it's just a few people that actually like adventure out to try to take on the tower to to get everybody out of there um and and it it does it in a way where when people die in the anime you really you really feel like they died it doesn't just feel like like oh it's this big battle and like people died or whatever it's like really really impactful um and so yeah it's it's definitely uh one of my favorite animes that actually sounds like it would be really up my street like that genuinely sounds like something i might have to to watch um but yeah i'm, I'm interesting to interested to hear what you think of uh, blue eye samurai now okay because cool. I, I think I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know if you you agree, but I think there's like with anime, there's like anime, and then there's anime. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Right. One's quite accessible, and I think then the second one, it's like I personally struggle a little bit when it goes too far into it. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, that's that's my problem with with a lot of anime. There's um, gay. I would say Gabe is very into anime, and I'm like a casual. I there's like a couple that I like. Um, and every, every now and then I'll, I'll stumble onto one that kind of takes over my life for a little while, but, uh, yeah, I'll definitely have to definitely have to check out blue eyed samurai. All right. Well, would you guys like to get out of here? It's 10 o'clock for Holly over there in, uh, in the UK. And, uh, I got some editing to do today and whatnot, so we can, we can bounce if you guys want any any final thoughts or anything. Looking forward to next week's live stream. <laughs> yeah, yes. that's gonna be that's gonna be it's gonna be cool, man. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm excited to see what uh what games you cook up and what mm -hmm. you know little tricks are up your sleeve. Yeah, I've yeah. got some I've got some some ideas that I will not be telling you about in advance. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Just have to wait and see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. That would be good fun. Um, yeah, it's all Sweet. good. Yeah, bring bring as many like games and and topics as as you'd like. Um, for people that are watching this video, the the live stream has probably already come out. 
Um, so if if you're watching this now and didn't get to catch the live stream, just go to our channel homepage, click over to the live tab, and you'll see it right there. Uh, we'll also put a link for it in the like community post tab, um, so you can check it out there. But I'm really looking forward to it. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit nervous. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm a little yeah. nervous. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I think I think it'll be a ton of fun. I think it'll be a great way to celebrate a um, hundred episodes. And I don't know, it'll just be fun to like to see who joins us, and there may yep. be like blocks of time like an hour or whatever where it's just me and gabe shooting the shit or whatever yep. but then somebody will randomly join and they'll be on for a couple hours or whatever yeah. and um and then i've also made like a be right back screen so if we need to just like pause the whole thing i can put up the be right back oh, cool and we can take our bathroom break or whatever we awesome. need to do um so that's cool but uh yeah i'm i'm looking forward to it i think it'll be a ton of fun um but yeah, Holly, thank you so much for joining us. It was awesome talking about uh, the hollows and I'm looking forward to uh, to reading the rest of it. I'm going to get back on that tonight and uh, see how many chapters I can chew through. And uh, yeah, thank you everybody for for hanging out. Can I uh, just interject with one last little thing just before? Of course. We just yeah, because. Do I don't know if uh, you guys are aware of this, but I want to do a little plug, if I may, for my very good friend, Tim Hardy, who has today announced that he is going to be doing a Kickstarter for the Hall of Bones to turn it into an audio book. It is just one of my favourite books, um, a Norse fantasy that absolutely deserves to be made into an audio book mm -hmm. with, of course, RJ Bailey at the helm. Yeah. Uh, just want to give that little plug and say to people, if you can and want to support it, please go and sign up for the Kickstarter. Uh, the pre-launch page is up now so people can sign up for notifications and to find out when it goes live. So Awesome. Get that yeah. one in there. Yeah. Yeah, we will be having uh we'll be having Tim Hardy on the show Saturday, March 16th for a live stream to uh to promote his Kickstarter. Sweet. Um that I think will have been started for five days by that point. Or or I think it starts on the eleventh. Um, so check that out if you'd like. Uh I'm not sure exactly what time we agreed on. Uh, well, RJ Bailey is coming, so it's probably it's probably like eleven PST is is the time that we'd we'd be doing it. Um, so yeah, check that out, and you can learn more about uh, the Hall of Bones and uh, about him about both of them making an audiobook. It is Hall of Bones, right? That's the one he's yes. doing the audio for. Okay, cool, awesome. Well, all right, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with us. We are going to wrap it up here. Uh, as always, you can reach out to us on Twitter, Discord, or Patreon, where you can get exclusive content for just $3 a month. Uh, pretty soon, we'll be adding uh, live shows to Patreon as well for the next tier up. Uh, if you'd like to see some of the episodes that usually go on to our youtube that just get posted as a video uh if you'd like to see those recorded live we'll be doing that sometime in the future as well uh but we also do after dark episodes where we kind of chat like we just did just now where we kind of go off topic and and talk about whatever and uh and we post that there for you guys so thank you so much for supporting us there uh, if you'd like to support us in another way, you can subscribe and like here on YouTube. It definitely helps us with the algorithm, and we appreciate every single person that does it. We're so close to a 1,000 subscribers. We are, like, inching towards it, and we're going to get <laughs> monetized uh, this year for sure. So I'm super excited for that. Thanks again to everybody who, who yes. subscribes and helps us towards that goal. But yeah, if, uh, if you'd like to just chat with us here on YouTube, you can absolutely do that too. Leave us a comment down below and, uh, you know, tell us what your favorite show on Apple TV <laughs> is or, uh, or if you like Sex Education or any of the other shows that, uh, that we talked about. But um, that is going to wrap us up for there, for today. <laughs> we'll for see there. you guys later. Bye. Bye. Bye.